Oh my word. That I wasn't expecting at all. If you've never done it before, 10 seconds is a good plan. Wow! Look at that. Who's this boy? Wow. Okay, I have got to make me a clear fronted microwave and take a look at those. Good. So this is the the last level of insanity that I have. So here I have four liquids. This one is hexane. This one is water. This one is pure ethanol. And then last but not least, we have dichloromethane. What you got here is roughly what you would see if you were to take a look at all those liquids I just showed you blown up about yeah, 10 billion times. So what happens when we put all of these into a microwave? Well, I was always told when I was at university that when the, yeah, the microwaves, when they, they get absorbed by something, they have to basically be of the same wavelength as the oscillation you've got here-ish. And the microwaves that you have in the microwave ovens are specifically tuned to water. I never really questioned that for the last 20 years until I did that last video. And then I was thinking, really? Is that, you know, only, only water? So I thought, right, I'm going to pour all these liquids into the microwave and we'll see what we get. So here you've got some water molecules, H2O. You've got some dichloromethane. Methane is CH4, but we've taken off two of those hydrogens and replaced them with two chlorines. Uh, we've got ethanol, ethyl alcohol. Um, that's the stuff you drink and makes you drunk. Uh, usually drunk in about a 10% solution. That's about wine. Um, and then, of course, we've got hexane, which is not that far off what runs your car. Now, all of these molecules are about on the right scale. And the, all the bonds here are about the right length. The molecules are about the right size. And the way they're actually laid out at the moment is about right for how far apart these various molecules would be in solution. So the water molecules tend to be a little more bunchy. Dichloromethanes tend to be a bit further apart. Ethanols... Yeah, somewhere between the two. Critical things with water. Uh, first of all, H2O. The two hydrogens have kind of a positive charge on them. The oxygen kind of a negative charge. And that is absolutely critical for the reason why you don't just evaporate into, into gas. Uh, because if these molecules weren't held together so strongly, they would just evaporate. And... So this is the OH bond, and that's about right for the distance of the hydrogen bond. And so water tends to hydro... It's a three-dimensional structure, but it's, it's kind of like that. And the cute thing about that is the dipoles on the molecules are also aligned. What the hell's a dipole? The hydrogens are kind of positively charged. The oxygen is kind of negatively charged. So you get this thing that's kind of like a magnetic field. The problem it's not magnets. It's electrostatics. It's called a dipole. And if you align all the dipoles in solution then it's, it's much happier. You know, it's like magnets sticking together. Water has this really strong dipole on it and can hydrogen bond together very nicely. Dichloromethane, uh, well, the chlorines are kind of negatively charged and the hydrogens are yeah, somewhat positively charged. So dichloromethane also has quite a decent dipole on it. But of course, there are no OH bonds. Then we've got ethanol here. Uh, who has the OH bond, so it also hydrogen bonds really quite strongly in solution, which again tied up some fairly anomalous properties of ethanol. It also is quite a big molecule. There's a lot of it that doesn't hydrogen bond to anything. All of these groups here are very low charge density groups, so they don't really do anything. And then, of course, you've got hexane, which is all like that. And hexane, yeah. Not that far off what you put in your car. There, there are two possibilities. It could be tied up to the OH bond somehow. Yeah, you know, some sort of, I don't know, weird OH type interaction is of the right frequency. And if that's true, then it'll work for water and for ethanol, but not for dichloromethane, because there are no hydrogen bonds in dichloromethane. 
and if it's just that you need a strong dipole and the molecules need to be free and rotatable then dichloromethane, water and ethanol should work and there is no dipole on this whatsoever so it doesn't matter if it's if it's rotating at the right frequency or not yeah I need the dipole to be rotating at the right frequency for the light so let's see what happens hexane which has no significant charge on any of the molecules whatsoever and so it shouldn't heat up at all in theory i have never done this experiment before in my life okay so what we're going to do is we're going to arrange those in a nice neat little cross like that and let's dance so in the first instance i'm probably just going to give it 10 seconds for the simple reason that yeah, heating things if you've never done it before 10 seconds is a good wow look at that who's this boy who's this boy ethanol ethanol is the massive winner and i'll give you my instant reading on what that is is it's all about degrees of freedom and heat capacity which means that ethanol doesn't have as many degrees of freedom lower heat capacity heats up more quickly uh water well, what's this boy dichloromethane also heats up pretty well uh hexane nothing nothing at all and regular water Looks like it heats up more in the middle than at the bottom, but uh, okay, there we go. Awesome. So um, let's let's give it another ten seconds and see what we can do. So I'm going to change the heat range on the camera and also start recording. is so awesome okay let's do it so 10 more seconds and 10 seconds and again the massive clear winner in all of this is ethanol pure alcohol Heats up crazily better than... Where's water? There's water. That's ethanol. Water. There's dichloromethane. How's he doing? He's sort of comparable to water. And then finally hexane. That is so cool. So cool. That is a kilogram of silver. So question, what happens when we put this into the microwave? Now, obviously we're gonna to have to get temperature on this at some point, at which point if we look on the thermal camera, we'll see an instant problem. Metals look super shiny in the infrared, which in practice means you yeah, can't get a temperature on them. So it basically shows you the temperature of whatever is reflected in the metal. So I'm actually putting a bit of tape here, there. You can't really even see it on this, but it's just about there somewhere. It's a nice piece of transparent tape, but that does mean that I can now get a sensible temperature reading on the, um, on the metal. So cool, let's stick them in the microwave for 30 seconds and see what happens and not a lot in the way of sparks or anything that goes on there now you'll recall from the previous video i was telling you the metals are basically yeah fairly reflect yeah they're is reflective in the microwave region as they are in the infrared but this should come out remarkably unmicrowaved but we will see and 
what do we have? There are some signs of heating. But the heating, <laughs> sadly enough, is actually more just where the metal block was sat. That's so weird. Oh my word. That I wasn't expecting at all. You can see the frequency of the... I, I think that's the frequency of the microwaves. That, I think, is the wavelength of the microwaves. Yeah, that's, that's about focused. Cool. Um, so, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Anyway, right, the most important thing is that if we focus on our block, that there's almost no temperature change on this whatsoever. Great. So, what I've got here is I've got two identical pots, which I am going to fill up to an identical level. We're one with water, and the other one is going to have a solar block in. Perfect. Good. All right, so those two now have the same volume in both of those. So if I now close these up and put them in the microwave, which one do you think is going to heat up more? So I gotta tell you that silver is one of the best thermal conductors so you expect it to almost instantly reflect the heat of the water or very quickly. Good. So let's give it a full 30 seconds. So what you're actually really going to see here is essentially heat capacity per volume. So with one, we're putting the same amount of heat into both of these objects and we're going to see how much that actually increases their temperature. And we are done. And <laughs> what you see is the one with no metal in is much cooler than the one with metal in it. Let's give it another, let's give it another 30 seconds. Three, two, one. Boom. That's pretty convincing. And now comes the question, oops, is this actually, is the silver at the same temperature that's the water. Pretty close. All right, so this is now the band that I was telling you gives you the real temperature of the metal. As you can see, it's pretty close. Now you might be thinking that's all terribly interesting, but none of it of any great value whatsoever. Well, here we have some whiskey stones. So they're like, little metal cubes that you can stick in your whiskey uh, or these ones are made of some sort of stone. So the question is, if I have some here that have been already cooled down in the freezer to the same temperature, which one is going to be more effective at cooling down the whiskey? So we're going to take uh, one of those in there and one of those in there and we will see who is better at cooling and it's the one on the left is certainly quicker oh certainly quicker but the question is, which one will actually provide more cooling? Well, that looks pretty conclusive that actually... Oh yeah, wow, that's really, really quite impressive. So the metal ones are actually, yeah, in terms of the speed at which they cool at, are much better 
So let's let's throw the other one in just to be certain. Okay. We will see how quickly that leaches out its coal into the solution. Oh wow, the metal ones are much quicker. It looks like they've got much better heat capacity as well. So, if we want to be completely fair, let's just see how much these things weigh relative to each other. So the metal ones come in at about 31 grams. And the stone ones come in at 20. But it is an absolute no-brainer in terms of which one cools your whiskey down quickest. Yeah, that's really quite impressive. So this one is definitely cold to the touch. This one, barely at all. So there you go. The metal whiskey stones are actually much, much better at cooling your, your drink down than the stone ones. Just can't hack it. Awesome. Okay, this is a question asked by precisely no one. What happens if I take a nice piece of gallium like that, which melts at about body temperature, and stick it into a microwave? So let's find out what happens. Wow! <laughs> okay, I have got to make me a clear fronted microwave and take a look at those.